Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Brett and Jay. Make sure you tune in to The Michael Finkley Show on Roku and YouTube. If I can make it through the night Just to see a brighter side Cause I've been working all my life Just to make it If I can make it through the night just Hello everybody, welcome to Michael Geek The Show. I'm Michael Finkley, thank you for joining us. Now, I've always wanted to go into the arena of radio, television, after I graduated from college. But it started with my mama. My mama did radio in our hometown of Mullen, South Carolina for 20 years, 20 years of her life. I would listen to her on radio and I would say, Mama, can you play this song, that song for me? And this is when we had cassettes, right? I would record the songs and listen to them at my leisure. It was amazing. I saw how she inspired so many people and I wanted to do the same thing. When I was in college, I did my first internship at Glory Communications in Columbia, South Carolina. I didn't have any airtime, but it was amazing to see the daily operations of a radio station. And after that, I still pursuing education as my number one goal, but also having that niche in the back of my mind and saying radio, television, radio, television. It was an amazing journey. I had a lot of doors closed in my face. I tell you, a lot of doors closed in my face, but it allowed me to start my own platform, something that I've been wanting to do for years. I sat on this idea of the Michael Finkley Show for years. Didn't know how to get started. Many people telling me to do this, that, and the other. Was scared to do it. So during the pandemic, we launched April 13th of 2020. It was an awesome experience, and we were a hit to many people viewing our publications, our platforms every week. It was amazing. It still is. Still having people come out to reach out to you saying, I want to be on your platform, which is an amazing thing. So today I was able to interview two, two of my influences, more so in the industry. They have been in the industry now for 30 plus years, which is they know what they're talking about. We have Curtis Wilson of ABC Columbia and also two radio personality of the Big DM, also in Columbia, South Carolina, and also Les Trent, senior correspondent of Inside Edition. So don't you go away, y'all. And for another treat, we'll be back. Next, we have Curtis Wilson. Back in a moment. Next, Finkley. Fitness saved their lives. Chris Waddy and Del Robinson tell their stories. Next Finkley. Monday. Hey everybody, my name is Arthur Vernon R. Matthews Jr. I just wrote a new book called Family Ties and I also want to say a special shout out to one of the kids that I mentored and has got his own TV show on Roku, Michael Finkley, and this is 100th episode. So if you guys want to really hear about this book and see what's going on, check out Mike Finkley on The Finkley Show. And hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Michael Finkley Show. Y'all, my next guest beside me, he is a TV and radio personality and also an officer of the law. We have Curtis Wilson. Thank you for being with us, Curtis. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. So I must ask, when did you know and realize the potential of your voice? Uh, very young age when mm -hmm. you know, a lot of folks would talk about my age. I mean, my voice when I was like, a, a kid growing up in Brooklyn, New York. And, but then I don't know what happened, but I had this affinity for radio. Always wanted to be a radio personality since I was really? a youngster up in the projects. Yeah. Mom used to give me the broom, tell me to go sweep up and I'd be in my room <laughs> and then that broom was my microphone as I was listening to the radio. So yeah, it was, it's been an instill in me as a kid. Wow. What were some of your major influences to be that personality? Oh, uh, listening to uh, Frankie Crocker, one of my favorites uh, personalities in New York at WBLS, along with Kid Spiderweb. And, and then, you know, just the, the love of music, being a DJ as a kid, 
Uh, I remember, <laughs> didn't have equipment, grew up in a project, so you know didn't have a lot of money. And as a kid, we would, you know, make our extra money by cleaning up, you know, the, the community center after parties. And then one particular night we were there and the DJ didn't show up. So it was like, I felt it was my opportunity. And only thing I had in the house, my parents had was this big stereo that had the turntable, you know, the little turntable in the top. They actually believed in me. They put that big old thing on a dolly, rolled it all the way down the community center. Now in the house is loud, mm -hmm. <laughs> not loud in the community center. <laughs> but that was my first taste of being a DJ. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Yeah. And as life went on, did you even realize that you will be touching the lives of others through your golden voice? You know, I, I, I hear that a lot. But of course, with me, I keep my feet planted firm on the ground. Don't get the big ego head and yeah. just do what I do because I love doing it. But I do appreciate the folks who, you know, tell me they appreciate what I do, the laughter I bring or the, the great information that I give them as well. So I just mm -hmm. strive to do the best every single day. Every single day, you have to give them 100 percent because yeah. you never know when it's going to be your last show or you never know mm -hmm. what you're saying, how it affects other people. So that's why I always try to keep it positive. Gotcha. Definitely. And through that positivity and through you being humble, you have been successful in your own right. What type of success have you seen in these many years in this industry? <laughs> well, you know, for me, being able to be in radio for as long as I've been, I've been at DM just over 30 years, but I've been in radio itself probably over 45 years now. So it's been a long time in the business doing radio. And the doors just continue to open up. You know, when you have a great personality and great positive attitude, people like that and they gravitate. And so uh, here it is. I was doing radio here in Columbia, never did TV before in my life. Mm -hmm. And the general manager calls me out of the blue to ask me if I'm interested in doing that. That opened up. The door. And then being on television, you know, kept showing African-American faces on TV. And I felt it was also my duty to try to do something to combat that, which is why I crossed over also into law enforcement and Sheriff Lott welcomed me as well. So the doors just kept opening up. And then the opportunity doing what I do, being out in the public, University of South Carolina calls me to say, hey, we want you to be a part of our athletics program to create fun in, in the atmosphere and the energy on court. So the doors just kept opening up. So to me, those were the blessings of doing what I do every day. That is amazing. Amazing. Oh, my gosh. And as we said before, you have been a mentor in my mind. I've always wanted to go into radio and television. My mom was um, in radio for almost 20 years in our hometown of Mullen, South Carolina. And when I got to Allen University, my last year, I actually did an internship at Glory Communications right there um, mm -hmm. in Columbia. And it was just amazing. It was just an amazing thing. And so yeah. when doors were, open, were always closed in my face to the industry, I'm like, I'm just going to start my own platform and bring it my way. So yeah. um, in my mind, you've always been that driving force for me. And I just I don't I want to say thank you. And when you said okay. yes and saying you will talk to me, I, I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. No thank worries. You so thank you. That. I appreciate it, too. No, no doubt about that, you know. And also, too, real quick, I also have to give big shouts to Benedict as well, because Benedict also opened doors for me, mm -hmm. not only, you know, to do the athletics uh, side of things, but also the academics, because I never went to college. I was able to do radio and television without a college degree. And Benedict offered that to me. And I was able to go to classes while doing radio and TV and being mm -hmm. physically in those classrooms. It was a tough time. But of course, you know, I believed in myself. I yeah. believed in family and I also believed in God. God wasn't going to put, you know, more on my shoulders than mm -hmm. I can handle. But just oh. uh, stayed the course and was able to, to accomplish that mission, too. So big shouts to Benedict. Benedict College. HBCU <laughs> love over here. That's what BC. it is. That's what it is. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah. and as you were talking, I rem you remind me of the scripture. A man's gift will make room for him. God will qualify you. So you are an example and a definition of that. So, wow, that just is amazing to hear. So inspirational. And so as you again, you talked about your time with in, in law enforcement as well. Is this something that you always wanted to do as well? Or was there another opportunity for you? Yeah. You know, for me growing up, I wanted to be either a lawyer, radio personality or, or get into law enforcement. Now, I didn't become a lawyer, but I do debate a lot. <laughs> but I was able to accomplish my I dreams of being on TV it. and my dreams of being in radio. So when I go out and I talk to these youngsters, I tell them no matter where you come from, it's within you. You're capable of accomplishing your dreams. Nobody can stop you from doing that but you. I mean, my GPA was low out of high school, 
uh, again, grew up in the hood, didn't have much, but accomplishing these goals, just staying the course and staying focused and not uh, letting anything or anyone deter me. That's what people need to understand when you're young mm -hmm. and you try to find yourself. That's all you got to do. Mm -hmm. Another driving force. You get to yeah. keep that personal success where you see yourself in the future. And mm -hmm. so what's next for Curtis? <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to teach. I wanted to teach at Benedict. So I have my, you know, my, my degree, but I need that master's in order mm -hmm. to really teach. And, you know, when you stop going to school, <clears throat> it's tough to pick it up and go again. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. but maybe an adjunct professor or something like that. Or, you know, to me, when people call me or they send me messages and ask me about getting into broadcasting and so forth, I'm teaching them that way as well. May not have that degree, True. but yeah. I do reach out and, and uh, I'll let them know any knowledge that I have because what I have, I can't take with me. So why not share it? You know? So, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. And that is another form of teaching. As you said, you don't need, as, as God has proven to you time and time again, yeah. you don't need that piece of paper. You have the experience and that door will open up for you because you have a made up mind and Absolutely. wanting to do that. What yeah. type of advice would you give to those wanting that are seeing you right now and saying, I want to be just like him? What would you uh, tell them? I want them to, I want them to be better than me. You know, go that extra step to do something that no one has done. Um, because we always talk about, you know, uh, break out of that square and the whole nine yards and this and that. But to me, be you, but learn from others. See what others are doing, take it in and then make it better and take it and make it your own. Um, because in radio right now, as you know, it's changed a lot. You got uh, syndicated radio, you got voice tracking, you got, um, um, uh, it's just a whole bunch of, it's just totally different. So for somebody who wants to get into radio and be that radio personality, you can't just say this was, that was, as far as the song was, or tell me about the weather. You gotta be able to tell me something that's gonna capture me and make sure I'm being entertained by what you're saying. So go that extra step, do your homework. I show prep every single day, sometimes twice a day, because I wanna make sure that whatever I'm saying is gonna be interesting to you. And that, that person who wants to get into this business, have to, they have to be hungry. They have to be willing to go that extra mile to put that work in so that therefore they don't sound like somebody across town. They don't sound like somebody who's next door. They wanna be them, but be creative, be entertaining. Make me feel like I'm going to miss something if I don't listen to you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. And yeah. where can they see you or even hear you? Well, of course, uh, I'm on the Big DM 101.3 FM in Columbia. And I'm on six days, 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. And then I'm also on in Greenville at 107.3 Jams. And I'm mm -hmm. there on Saturdays from 2 to 6. Mm -hmm. And then on television, Monday through Friday, you can catch me on ABC Columbia Channel 25, 5 to 7 a.m. And then with Richland County, uh, you might see me anywhere. <laughs> Just about all about. Oh, wow. And, wow. What can I say? Y'all is Curtis Wilson. Thank you for being with us and sharing your wisdom, your knowledge you. and your experience through your words. Thank you. Thank you for what you do and keep doing what you do, because trust me, somebody's listening, somebody's watching, and they're taking everything that you do to heart. And that's a great thing. So God bless you. Thank you so much. Back in a moment. Coming up, Les Trent. Back in a moment. Hi, my name is Ashley Bates. I'm formerly from Nickelodeon's All That. You can catch me on the Michael Finkley Show on the Roku TV and YouTube. flexible and she is a multitasker. She is a wife, a mom, she is city councilwoman, she, yeah. When I was growing up, mom worked outside the house and so my dad was an entrepreneur. I saw him leaving early in the morning or late at nights to go meet with clients and he was always one who told me, you know, if you show up on time, you're late. I just admire how she's able to not only juggle the demands of her jobs, but keep her family really first. The outstanding thing about the Isaac family is their noble contributions to improving the quality of life for our Colombians and people all over this state. Aye. Aye, Tamika Isaac, to Solomon Square. Discharge the duties thereof, so help me God. So help me God. Congratulations and blessings. 
I first ran because I saw a need, I saw a void that needed to be filled, a voice uh, that wasn't there. And over the last several years, I feel like I've been able to be that voice. So often as women in whatever spaces that we're in, um, we are often discounted because we're a mom or we're a wife or we have this career. And she's an everyday woman who shows women what excellence looks like. She has walked the walk of being a small business person, of being a parent, of sending her kids to school. Columbia is a great place, and we have done a lot in the last few years as far as law enforcement. But law enforcement can't do everything, nor should it do everything. We have to really expand upon the tools, technology, and community policing, investing in our communities uh, so that law enforcement is a partner with our communities. Being a Columbia native, I've seen the way this city has grown. It's grown to the point that sometimes not everybody's been a part of that growth. I want to make sure that communities, specifically communities of color, make sure that they are part of Columbia's present and its future. I want to have a climate plan for this city that not only helps us be sustainable, but also helps provide opportunities for folks in the workforce. There are so many opportunities to take advantage of technology, uh, green energy. I want to be the advocate for growing our city and being on the forefront, not just looking at what other cities are doing and following them, but being the leader. If you don't have the right leadership, you're gonna miss a lot of opportunities. I think having a woman as mayor of the city of Columbia is long overdue. I'm Tamika Isaac Devine, and I'm running for mayor of the city of Columbia. Need a little motivation. Timothy Clifton is with us every week on Mondays to get your week started with a little motivation. All here on The Michael Finkley Show. Hey, welcome back to The Michael Finkley Show. Now, my next guest, I know you've probably seen him before. He is a Emmy-nominated senior correspondent of Inside Edition. He is Les Trent. Les, <laughs> with us today. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> virtual oh, high five. <laughs> virtual high five, sir. It is an honor to be in your presence, sir. Pleasure talking to you, Michael. <laughs> like I was telling you before, I grew up watching you literally with my grandparents watching the stories leading up to Inside Edition. I still watch it uh, on YouTube as well and all that kind of good stuff. So, Les, when did you actually know that you had a voice as a gift. Mm. Wow, I, I, was, I was very young and I was always on stage doing something, um, whether it was uh, reading something at an assembly or, or um, singing in church. I, was always, I always wanted to be on stage. Uh, but when I got to high school, I really thought that I was going to be an architect because I also, I also loved drafting. And uh, I had a drafting teacher in the 10th grade. And I'm like, listen, this is what I want to do. And he looked at me and he goes, you know, there's no money in architecture. Now, I think he told me that probably because I was not very good. <laughs> so that's what I said. Oh, that's a you know what? I, I'm going to pursue then what I really want to do. I said, I'm going to pursue journalism. And, and you know, I took a year off from uh, after high school and before I went to college and there were people who said, don't do it. It's a mistake. You'll never go. But I, I said, I am absolutely going to college. Mm -hmm. And I did. I grew up in Canada. I'm half Canadian. My mother was Canadian. Really? So was, yeah, yeah. I, I went Fun to college. Yeah, it, I went to college in Toronto, Seneca College. And um, I was lucky because I'm half American. Mm -hmm. So my father was American. My mother was Canadian. And we lived in a border town um, at, at Buffalo. So Buffalo was on one side. Fort Erie, where I went to high school, was on the other side. And when I graduated from college, I went back to Fort Erie for a couple of years. And I got a job at the newspaper in Fort Erie, Canada, and uh, at a radio station in Buffalo. So I would go mm -hmm. back and forth across the border <laughs> every day. And it just sort of it's just sort of went from there. I was I was lucky enough to have some great mentors along the way. Again, I always knew that I wanted to be on television, but 
I had no problem um, starting off in radio. I loved radio. I'd be there today if, if you know, if it, if it worked out that way, it would have been fine by me. Um, and I did, you know, I worked at three or four radio stations. I worked at a, um, worked at a black radio station in Buffalo. You know what the call letters are? WBLK. They've been around. <laughs> That's right. Anyone That's ironic. watching from Buffalo, they know WBLK is still around. They are a powerhouse. Oh. So I worked there. I worked at a couple other stations. And then I finally got uh, into television behind the scenes as, a, mm -hmm. as an associate producer. And, and I just, you know, I would go out with, with reporters every once in a while and steal their tapes and put a tape together. And, and I just and I got on air from there. Wow. So when was your, in your mind, when was your big break? When did you say, hmm, I think I can do this for real? <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was after I started as a weekend producer. First of all, my job was, I, I was, a, I was a, a associate producer. So my mm -hmm. job was to sit down with the producer every night. He would, he or she would give me a bunch of stories to write and I'd have to write them, um, go in with the editor and that was my job as an associate producer. Then they made me the weekend producer, which meant I was in charge of four shows. So I was in charge of the six and 11, both Saturday and Sunday. And I was this young kid, you know, fresh out of radio, fresh out of college. Mm -hmm. And I had to do everything. So I had to tell the assignment editor what I wanted covered. I had to write most of the show. Um, it was it's a tough, skeleton sir. staff. Yeah, it was crazy. And I had to back time the show to 30 minutes. So, so I had this, I had this good friend. He was a sports cast man named Brian Blessing. And if I ever came up short, because it's hard to write 30 minutes show, right? I mean, the only the other thing you have are, uh, is weather and sports. That's right. not the, and everything else was on me. So this sports guy named Brian Blessing, I would say to him, Brian, I need you to, I need you to feel like, two extra minutes tonight. And he's like, I gotcha. And he was so good. And that's another, you know, I, you learn from people like that because I would watch him. He would write out maybe three words and then he'd have an, a producer who had put all the highlights together and I would watch him and he'd be just like this. He'd be looking at the screen. He'd be looking down at the monitor. He'd be doing this. And he was like, it was, it was a work of art. <laughs> it was amazing. So I learned from, from people like that in, in, mm -hmm. Buffalo and Buffalo was such a small town that, you know, you, you got to do everything. You had to do everything. Right. You know, you had to, it, we weren't shooting. Uh, reporters didn't shoot back then, but we did have to go out and, and um, I mean, went out with a camera person and um, we, we had to sit there for hours of recovering a court case. And then you'd have to come out and you'd have to somehow regurgitate what just happened in court and do a live shot. And it was like trial by fire. <laughs> but I learned everything I really need to know in Buffalo. And you asked the question when I think I got my, I got my big break, my big break really was uh -huh. finally getting on the air because, you know, was it, I would say to them, um, listen, I, I really want to be a reporter. And they go, well, we don't have an opening. We like where you like where you are. Mm. And uh, then I got a job offer um, from across town. And so they put me on air as a reporter like three days a week. And I was still mm -hmm. producing the weekends. And then I got another job offer from across town to be the weekend anchor. And I was like, okay, I got to go. <laughs> so, so I went across town. Um, there was um, in weekend anchor it was also tough because I did the six and 11. Um, and I had a, I had a black female co-anchor. We were the first all black anchor team in Buffalo. It was me and my, and my good buddy wow. to this day. Sandy White, and we co-anchored the six together, and I anchored mm -hmm. the eleven solo. So there were many times where, after the six o'clock news, I would go out with a camera guy and shoot a story. And I'd come back and I'd write it, and sometimes I would edit it myself. And we had this working newsroom, which was crazy because you'd be sitting here like this, and the edit room is right there, and the so control room, the, the control room's over there. So you're sitting there. And you could actually, there were times where you'd be reading the lead story and you can see, because I can see behind me right now, you would mm -hmm. see that the camp, that the editor is running the tape into the control room. So you're like, should I stall now before we get to it? Or should I start the newscast 
on page two. So all of that craziness was just great training because once you, you know, when you, when you do all of that, then when you get to a market like San Francisco, where I went next, Mm -hmm. you don't do half of that. So everything's like a cakewalk from there. (laughs) I would imagine so. Yeah. That is a lot. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was insane. It was insane. Wow. But I love it. All of that experience, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, helped you to where you are now. We know you're from Inside Edition. How did that come about for you? Well, when I was in San Francisco, you know, you talk about how you used to watch the show uh, with your mom. And uh, I also loved the show. Mm-hmm. And it came on after our newscast in San Francisco. I worked for a TV station called KPIX. And it came on after us. And at the time... It was the story about the Long Island Lolita, um, Amy Fisher. Remember, Amy Fisher was the one who shot her lover in the face. Yeah. Yeah. So I would watch that every night after our newscast. And I'd be, I'd be sitting there like this. What? Mm-hmm. What? <laughs> this is insane. So then I get, this, I get this phone call from the producers of Inside Edition. And they go, hey we are starting a sister show called American Journal. Would you like to come aboard? And I'm like, sure. And it was a little bit different from Inside Edition because Mm -hmm. we did longer form stories. Our stories were about seven minutes long. We would have, our show would only have three stories in it. And when I traveled, I would be gone for a week and I would come back with 10 tapes. And, And we had such a huge staff back then. I would take those 10 tapes to a tape library, Mm. someone in the library would transcribe everything on that tape. So they would say, okay, shot one is a dog walking down the street. And then they, they would transcribe the entire interview. And then when I went to sit down to write my story, all I had to do was look at the transcript, see where my sound bites were, see where my video was, and then, and then write it from there. None of that exists anymore. First of all, reporters barely (laughs) write anymore uh, for a syndicated show because we do so many stories in a day that I'm out, I'm shooting something, I'm sending it back to the, to the studio. Um, I can even voice my stories now from home or even from the car. You know, we've got the, I've got a microphone and it's got a, um, it's got an audio interface that goes into my iPhone and you know, you could, you could do it on a busy street mm-hmm. and it is broadcast quality. So that has changed everything. Mm-hmm. And we do it a lot more now because of COVID in fact, because we were doing 90% of our work from home right. or on the road. I, what I do now is I rent a car every week and I drive and meet my camera crew wherever I have to meet them. And wow. you know, the, the producer will send the stuff back to, to the office, everyone's working from their own home. So the producers at their house, the editors at their house, there are a few people as a skeleton staff in the office, the people who are putting the show together. And we all sort of just do our thing uh, at home and send it into the server. (laughs) Then it's somehow gets done. It's insane. But teamwork makes a dream work. Yep. All working together. I say that every day. All working working together. I love that. I love that. And so being in this industry for over 30 years, how many times have you heard no? Well, in what respect? I mean, we talk about the respect of you wanting to gain, I guess, that next level of success that you see yourself Mm. in, or even in starting off to get to where you are at this point. That's a great question. You know why? Because I think I, when I was anchoring in Buffalo and and I had an opportunity to go to San Francisco as a reporter, I knew that um, once I got to San Francisco as a reporter, that I would probably never anchor again. And it's only because news directors see you in a certain way. If you come there as a reporter, it's, it's not as easy to go then to become the main anchor. Um, not for those of us of color, because, you know, we, we, we get pigeonholed. We, there's only so many of us um, who, who can be the anchor. There are only so many of us who can be the general assignment reporter. And, uh, and I certainly encountered that. 
So I think the biggest no I, I got and in, in it was was wanting to get back to the anchor desk. Um, and again, it was just, you know, the, the opportunity in their mind never came up. Right. Um, so, you know, I, what I, what I chose to do instead of, instead of first of all, being down about it or, or wanting to go to a smaller market and start over as an anchor, I just said, you know what, I'm going to be the best darn reporter that I can be. Right. And, uh, and so I gave up that, that idea that I wanted to be behind the anchor desk. And, and I think it's, it suited me better anyway, only because uh, I would be bored out of my mind. I just love being in the field. Every day is different. I swear, Michael, there are days where I don't know one minute to the next who I'm going to be interviewing. Someone will call me from the assignment desk and say, um, uh, "We have a we have an interview with this, you know, uh, this Olympian gold medalist." And, and I'm like, "Oh, okay, who is it?" Um, and here I am. I'm like, oh, "Let me do some research." <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I don't have time to talk to a producer about about what they need uh, from this person. So that experience just comes in where you just you just know, okay you know, we're talking about Simone Biles. So I'm, I know that I need to talk about, you know, what it's like psychologically to, to sort of lose that edge or to, to not have the confidence and, and how do you get over that? And so it's, um, you know, it's, again, all of that stuff comes from the craziness that I encountered in Buffalo from, you know, flying by the seat of my pants. Wow. <laughs> you mentioned earlier about you being a person of color in this industry, the good, the bad, the ugly, I know you're probably heard and seen it all. Mm -hmm. How has it been for you in these 30 years? And in your, your experience, has it gotten better? Oh, it's gotten better. Mm. You know, I better. I think we, we talk about it less today than we did back when I started. Really? Uh, yeah, we do, unfortunately. And I say, unfortunately, because, wow. because if you look around the landscape, um, if you look at all the markets around the country, you will see a lot of us and a lot of us anchoring, anchoring in towns that are predominantly white and anchoring in, anchoring in more suburban uh, places. But, um, you know, if, uh, of course, if you're just starting out, it, it is difficult Hmm. I, I'm trying to figure out whether or not it's more difficult now than it was when I started. And, and the reason I put it that way is because, uh, as I said to you before, you know, there's so many avenues now to get noticed uh, online. Yeah. And, um, and I think that there are a lot of young black stars and, and people in local news who really are doing incredible stuff. Um, I, it wasn't that easy for, for me when we were, when I was first starting out, because I think there was more of a thing about, um, like I said, there's going to be, you know, one anchor, one black reporter, you know, he, there was a, there was a, um, an old friend of mine who, who, before I actually knew her called me up because she knew I was anchoring in Buffalo mm -hmm. on the weekends. And she had been offered a job um, anchoring on the weekends. And I said to her, I said, well, I would take the job. I said, just know this. I said, uh, you're going to leave this job as a weekend anchor. Because I know how the market is in terms of, you know, promoting people of color to the main anchor job. And, and unfortunately, I was correct. Um, so I, I have over the years encountered that sort of quota system mm -hmm. and, you know, I've always belonged to, uh, I've always tried to belong to, um, um, you know, the, the, the black organizations in, in town to, cause we lifted each other up. You know, we would always tell people about, about jobs that were coming up, uh, or, or things that we knew about. Or if we were leaving, we would tell somebody because we knew that they could come into that job. 
Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been, a, it's been an interesting experience. Uh, and I think when it comes to being a, a black person in the newsroom, you know, the biggest impact I think is just on the decision-making, you know, you have to always speak your voice. I do the black producers I work with do, you know, we will always say something, something is not, is, is not right. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it's not bad intentions from the people who don't get it right. right. It's just lack of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a, it's just a lack of experience it, it, with other cultures. You know, I always say that, uh, you know, I'm bilingual. I can, I can speak, I could speak between the lines of, of what someone says uh, in a script. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, we can't say this shit. <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> so, um, so I, I think I've always tried to, I've always tried to use uh, my minority status to educate. Um, has it been hard? There've been some hard times. Yeah. Not as hard for me as for others, only because I got lucky in that I, I found something that I love and I didn't have to do a lot of moving around. I've only moved twice for work, um, it, you know, in 30 something years, uh, two or three times, but I mean, I, I moved around this area, but it was still in the same job. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I've been, I think I've been fortunate that way that I didn't have a lot of um, like some of my friends had had a more difficult time moving from place to place or, Mm -hmm. you know, losing their job and and trying to find another, Um, you know, I just, I just, I lucked out and I'm extremely lazy. And uh, so I just stayed. (laughs) Extremely lazy. Well, we know that now, Les, we know that now. (laughs) <laughs> oh wow so through it all you you told me earlier that you speak with a lot of students that want to pursue the things that you are you have done and what you're doing now as a journalist yeah. what encouraging words would you say to these students even persons that are watching now they're saying i want to be like them i would say this i i i had so many people growing up who friends parents who would say to me and teachers this is unrealistic. Uh, you're, you're never going to do it. And I was never, ever, I was never, it, it never bothered me when I heard that because I always knew that this was what I wanted to do. And I say the, to students all the time, if you are absolutely certain this is what you want to do, you will find a way to do it. And again, I think that you have so many more opportunities today than, than we did back in the day to get your face in front of somebody Uh, for us back in the old days to get your face in front of somebody, you, you had to, um, you know, send them a physical tape Mm -hmm. through an agent and do all these things. Uh, I've, I see stuff online all the time with people who have put together their own sizzle reel and, you know, imagine the advantage of putting that sizzle reel together and being able to email it to somebody over having to send a physical tape, through an agent or, or, yeah. or something like that. Um, and I'm not saying that agents are not a good thing. I, I, I think agents are great when it comes to getting your first job, um, but don't do it unless you've got a good polished tape together. I don't care where it comes from. If it's something that you did from college or something you do on your own. And that's another thing that, that is that you can do today that we, we never thought about doing back in the old days. And that is shooting your own story. You know, if you were out there, um, in the street and you, you, you come across some crazy accident or, or um, some sort of police misconduct and you're shooting video, shoot a stand-up, write a script, make a story. And you never know also in this landscape who would pick it up, what news entity might pick it up. Mm-hmm. So just, just work, work it like a job, like putting a that job. tape together. Just work it like a job. Wow. Wow. And that's, and that's advice for me too. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all, he is my good friend now. <laughs> he is 
Les Trent, thank you for being with us and telling us your stories and your experience in your words. Thank you. Michael, it's a pleasure. Yes, sir. Back in a moment. How you doing? This is Brad Butler in a second. I need you guys to tune in to the Michael Finkley Show on Roku TV via the Greater Works Network, or you can jump on YouTube and catch us there. All right, see you guys later. Calling all trio, gear up, jack, and other college readiness organizations. Hello everybody, it's Finkley with the Finkley Experience. I am here to offer you information about our College Readiness Cohort Series. This College Readiness Series includes college applications, SAT, ACT prep, scholarships, financial aid, the mental mind state, HBCU versus PWI versus technical colleges, and so much more. You know this is helpful because it's actually like making me change my college plan. <laughs> really? If you're interested, visit our website thefinkleyexperience.com or just email us at michael at thefinkleyexperience.com. We're looking forward to working with you. Next Finkley. Fitness saved their lives. Chris Waddy and Del Robinson tell their stories. Next Finkley. Monday. Everybody, welcome back. I do hope that you got something from the show, especially if you're aspiring to be in the field of communications or journalism, journalism broadcasting. This was a show for you. Thank you so much to our guest, Curtis Wilson, and also Les Trent for taking time out of their busy schedules to chat with us here at the Michael Finkley Show. Thank you so much. On the next Michael Finkley, we have two individuals where they say that fitness saved their lives. Fitness saved their lives. Their stories are incredible. We have Chris Waddy and also Dell Robinson, another show you don't want to miss. If you're not already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Michael Finkley Show. Ring that button for notification. We'll see an email saying, hey, new content's uploaded. Please listen to us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Visit our website, our newly designed website, michaelfinkleyshow.com. And also, you have that Roku TV, right? At the Greater Works Network, and you get to see our show on that network every Monday, every Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But if you miss us, we're all on demand too. Thank you so much for watching. And guess what? We'll see you next time. Have a good one.